special broadcast uh, to do this week and there was only a few things and kind of a little leftover thing I kind of wanted to do um, because there wasn't a whole lot going on thankfully this week there it was thankfully most of what was going on was pretty slow and or if it wasn't I did videos that I put out already about things but even at that that's relatively light compared to some of the things that I've spoken about on this show you know and that that's good because I don't like having to be able to have to cram a whole bunch of things a lot together I don't like getting behind on things because you never know what the next week might bring because you know that's why weekly broadcasts seem to work out with little regular videos in between I kind of like doing that so um, but this week I'm wanting to talk on a couple of things uh, one we're gonna talk I'm gonna speak about um, the U.S. government being hacked. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the, uh, Edward Snowden uh, speaking out once more about uh, privacy issues. Um, I'm going to talk about North, how North Korea's Songgong policy seems to be fading away, and a major uh, researcher seems to uh, professor um, seems to pretty much vol um, validate that. And then I'm also going to talk about um, about CPS corruption. So, yeah, we're just going to see how this goes. Um, so, yeah, let me stop talk about how um, this hack that was released recently. According to Reuters and uh, a couple other media outlets that I've got here, um, data was recently stolen uh, this last week uh, from the US government computers by suspected Chinese hackers including security clearance information and background checks that basically went back as far as about 1985 so um, US officials were said on Friday that and underlined the scope of one of the largest known cyber attacks on the federal networks the, according to Reuters, the breach of computer systems of the Office of Personal Management was, uh, Personnel Management was disclosed on Thursday by the Obama administration, which said records of uh, up to 4 million current and former federal employees may have been compromised. The hackings also raised questions about how the U.S. would respond if it confirmed that the Chinese government was behind it. Now, we really shouldn't be surprised by some of by these hackings and stuff like that. I mean, after all, we are in an age where China has pretty much deviated from the Mao, the old Maoist path, from the old days of Mao and commu um, of of socialism and building on to communism. I mean, if you really think about it, China has really only had a few small villages and communes that have actually made it all the way to it while the rest of the government has gone very revisionist and has gone down a very capitalist path because of this we now have a, a competing Chinese capitalist market with the very with the fringing uh, US capitalist market and with recent Chinese with Chinese uh, markets and the Chinese economy building and getting more investments from Russia and even become pretty much taking over the Asian market obviously and even some rumors that the Islamic community uh, the Islamic uh, countries are actually going to be transitioning to it basically the US's economy is well, teetering on the verge of ultimate screwdom, and we really shouldn't be surprised that China is looking to, you know, gather more intelligence on the U.S. and kind of monitor the situation, 
because frankly the Chinese know that the U.S. as an empire, as an as an economic superpower, is pretty much on the verges of you know pretty much on the verge of of its conclusion. So it's one of those things that we should not. Um, it's one of those things that we should not really be too surprised with. However, at the same time, let's also look at this as well. Accusations by the U.S. government sources of a Chinese role in the cyber attack, including possible state sponsorship, could further strain ties between Washington and Beijing. Tensions already heightened over Chinese assertiveness in pursuit of territorial claims in the South China Sea, as China is building upon its, well, its imperialist path, pretty much. It's looking to gain more control and more of a naval, become more of a naval power within within the Pacific realms. And well, all things aside, they are basically they pose a pretty big risk to U.S. imperialism overseas, especially when it comes to the Philippines, who pretty much the U.S. regard as theirs. So. With all this in mind, the U.S. and China, with their kind of very bumpy relationship, we shouldn't really expect anything less. Of course, and of course, this is going to lead to like cold, most likely into Cold War style, you know, talk and behavior and you know, wishy-washy bullshit. And frankly, I wouldn't really even. It, it doesn't. This whole thing doesn't really surprise me. The U.S. is continuing to put out this, trying to put out this this persona like it's you know the big bad wolf, like it's it's the the top dog and everything, like it has like it's the great you know empire that it only once was, and completely ignorant to the whole idea that. They really don't. That their word and their their attitude, behavior, doesn't really stick and doesn't hold much water anymore. Because the real the people that are actually being listened to now are the Chinese. I mean, Russia has recently signed packs with them. Um, most a lot of your Asian markets are starting to be have more be more influenced by the Chinese market. The Chinese yen is already being sought after as the, the currency to replace the US as the world's reserve currency. And that's why a lot of your anybody that knows basic economics and is a good businessman knows that it's going to that the, the this would be a good investment and that's why a lot of your Islamic states are most likely trying to flock to it and why pretty much the EU ha may have no choice at some point to look to an alternative other than its own euro and the US dollar so essentially the days of the US economy the days of the US superpower status those days are soon going to be in the past and by the I think these hackings and stuff like that are would be China's I think is basically China's uh, way of just monitoring the situation much like the US would monitor any other entity that it was looking to well occupy or have some sort of Cold War style conflict with and China is just stepping, staying a step ahead of the game and is trying to defend itself it wants to know what the US is thinking now when ultimately when I look at this I just look at it as two imperialist superpowers squaring off in the ring do I really like the idea of them hacking the US or the US hacking other groups no I think the whole idea of that sort of crap is stupid I think if you're going to actually do any sort of hacking and gain government information, I think it should be from the people itself so that they can use some sort of so they can use have some sort of information to use against said government. 
for an example, a light example would be what Edward Snowden did. That's what I personally think. Something that Chelsea Manning did. And I really think that's the only form of hacking that really does any good. And in the early days, even anonymous to an extent. But, yeah, anything, but at the same time, I just view this as just nothing more than imperialist superpower bickering. And, frankly, that's my whole opinion on it. But, uh, one official did say this could give China a huge advantage, and that's putting, that, that's just putting it on the basic touch. Yeah, China has the basic advantage, but China already has a basic advantage to begin with. It has, China has the upper hand militarily, it has it population-wise, it has it intelligence-wise, it has it in, in general, China is just, fuck it, we're gonna just say it. China is just better at playing this game than the U.S. has. It's kind of one of those things that brings up an old uh, expression that me and an ex-buddy used to have. Don't play a game that I can play better. And apparently the U.S. has been playing this game for a while, but they just got outplayed by China, plain and simple. But that's not really hard to figure out because most of the people in the U.S. government are, f are fucking retarded. Anyway... Um, one of the, the next thing I'd like to move on to is um, we've recently had a lot of things that have recently happened, such as the uh, this past week, uh, President Obama has uh, signed into law tighter restrictions for the National Security Agency that has quote unquote barred the organization from mass collection and storage of American phone records. Now, despite all this. Edward Snowden has recently penned a new op-ed uh, celebrating the recent reforms, but has also stated that um, that there actually is still privacy concerns, and that because technology companies are being pressured by governments around the world. And the, the best way I can go into describing what Snowden is talking about, basically just to give a, 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 a actual true explanation about that, is yes, while bourgeois liberally liberal reformist sort of views aside, we can look at. I mean, let, let's humor it for, just for the sake of argument. The reformist attitude is great when you uh, when you think about it from that bourgeois liberal standpoint. That oh yeah, well, they're not going to monitor our phone re our phones anymore. They're not going to do this. They're not going to do that. It doesn't really matter when you consider that the corporations and technology companies and while well, the government itself is going to want to know what people are, are talking about. They're going to want to be able to, to know whether there's, you know, the people support them or not because if your people don't support you and they get angry, they're going to, you know, and then yeah, they're going to start, you know, want, they're going to come after you, basically. Maybe not with guns, but at the very least they're going to start protesting and rioting and other sort of things. They're going to be very upset. In general, at the same time, the government is also, especially imperialistically, capitalistically, governments are going to want to know what, you know, they're going to want information on you. They're going to want to you know, exploit, you know, they're going to want to exploit you, they're going to want to, to be, know everything about your business and your, you know, all your affairs and stuff like that. It's just in the inherent nature, it's like an OCD problem or an itch that the government can't scratch, they have to fucking know everything about you. And with that in mind, they're going to, especially with as, you know, they're playing on kind of the last topic, as their the economy declines and as other you know situations get worse for you know them both economically and politically, they fear their power being being usurped. They fear losing their grip you know on the regime that they hold and the 
cloud of nonsense that they've built for us all to believe and you know the unicorns and rainbows and marshmallows and bull crap and as they're you know as they're they fear their power being taken from them or as they fear their power collapsing around them they're going to grip tighter and tighter they're going to resort to more draconian measures they're going to institute forms of surveillance they're going to institute paramilitary law and all kinds of other and send their Gestapo after us they're going to do our privacy does not mean jack shit when companies can basically buy votes they can buy politicians they can they don't even have to have elections because they can literally just buy elections these days so and so what so yeah a reform a, a reform that you know might make things a little better for now how long is that actually going to last because essentially technology companies and corporations and stuff like that are eventually going to buy out governments they're going to pressure governments that hey if you don't do what we say you're going to do you're not going to get elected you're not going to be in power any longer and so it's really that whole thing of wanting to you know be that popular it, it's kind of like wanting to be that popular kid in school and so essentially the politicians in order to be popular are trying to get the popular kids i.e. corporations to you know make them look good and you know try to be in their good graces so that they can stay in the limelight so they can keep their 15 seconds of fame so it's not going to matter as long as capitalism continues to exist as long as corporations and monopolies and you know all this these entities continue to exist there is no privacy for the for the ordinary citizen there is no true freedom for people and that is something that really needs to be understood by a lot of people we can reform and and requ and petition and and cry about it all the damn time saying that we you know less government interference we don't want to be spied on blah 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 protesting in asking for reforms doesn't do shit when they can give a concession but then take more but that concession comes with taking another form of your rights away or just basically curtailing it and going right around in circles like they're most likely going to do the only way that you're going to stop it is if you get rid of the system that's causing it to begin with to get rid of that draconian aspect to get rid of that government that happens to be doing what it's doing it's essentially time you know we can scream with you know get rid of corruption but capitalism breeds corruption that is basically what it's going to lead to capitalism is going to lead to corporatism capitalism is going to lead to monopoly capitalism is always going to be be exploitive and lead to exploitation it's going to lead to slavery like slave wages it's going to lead to draconianism and to mass surveillance it is the system itself that breeds the corruption it is not about reforming the laws it is about getting rid of the system that causes you know that causes this bullshit to happen in the first place is getting rid of that system that we don't even have to worry about having these laws reformed or even worry more about it being just a complete waste of our time because if you get rid of the system it's going to eventually solve itself so it's one of those things where you know I'm not taking away from what Edward Snowden's saying but he definitely Obviously, because he is a bourgeois liberal, it's, you know, pretty much, you know, been forced into exile by a totalitarian government. It really is one of those systems where, you know, he's going to, you know, be in favor of reforms and stuff like that. But he completely misses the actual point of why 
things are what they are and why he's in the position he is now. It's because of the system. Now, all things aside, personally, while we're under the system, I think that the system needs to give him, needs to pardon him and pretty much give him a medal of honor. But that's too much to ask from the bourgeois statists. But my opinion on that is just, yeah, while it is a, an achievement, I guess, it's a hollow victory that at the same time that this that these reforms have gone into effect because the NSA itself is a just a useless organization like Homeland Security they are just they serve no fucking purpose for this country other than pretty much to curtail our civil constitutional and universal human rights and that being said I really don't see why we even need to reform an agency that is draconian why we need to reform any laws for an agency that's already draconian it would be much easier to just get rid of I, I would think it would be just much easier to just get rid of those draconian agencies but then again it is a, it is just a fascist government so what else can we expect now I do want to speak about this personally because as a person that doesn't necessarily believe ever believe all the things and or support all the things about North Korea, I do like to talk specifically a lot about a lot of the things that go on, specifically ideologies, the government and politics and certain things like that. And one of those being is Song Gong. Now, recently a professor uh, from uh, Kyungnam University has recently said that the there has been a declining influence in the North Korean strategy over the over Kim Jong Il's uh, Songgong military or military first policy. Now, in 1994, after the fall of the Soviet Union, North Korea had suffered famine. It was basically isolated and it had pretty much lost a lot of its key allies, and being one of the biggest ones being the Soviet Union. Due to that, that meant that their, that a lot of their funding was gone, you know, they didn't have this person that, this big old brother that would stand there and de help, and help defend them. Basically, they were on their own. And facing, well, pretty much annihilation at the hands of U.S. imperialism, they had to resort to, mil uh, to this military first policy. The problem was, is that Song Gong policy was very much reactionary in an at, in, in a nutshell because a sin, w there's an old quote by now about how y you don't let the party become the gun that the party is there to serve uh, is there to serve the people and the gun is basically supposed to be well it, it is supposed to be subservient to the people and subservient to the party but the problem is, is that the party became the gun. The party became subservient to the military. The people became subservient to the military. And as that, and in that aspect, the the gun became the party. And recently, uh, Kim Jong Un, who came to power after his dad's death, has tried to transition. Um, away from Song Gong. In fact, it very look, much looks like th there is a declining influence. Now, I myself, myself spoke out about that. Uh, Jason Unruh spoke about that. Hell, he wrote a book about it, which I actually happen to have right here with me. Uh, Marx's Critique of Song Gong. And there is a lot of critiques that you could good say about Song Gong, its whole thing. But it was necessary in building North Korea's defense. They cannot win militarily. They could not. They could never win militarily against the U.S. because the U.S. just would annihilate them. So the best way possible to defend themselves and give themselves a fighting chance is to build their weaponry, to build, to build up their nuclear arsenal, to build up their their 
their science and technology, both nuclear and medical and everything else, that pretty much they're guaranteed under international law. And essentially just the right to defend themselves. And they were. They're trying to build their defenses up so that they at least, you know, that way they at least have a defense mechanism. They have anti-aircraft um, technology and stuff like that so that in the event that the U.S. wanted to try to invade them or their South Korean government puppets, they, you know, North Korea would actually stand a chance. Now that they've had this long period, this about 20 year period of being able to build their defenses and build their arsenal, build their military, build their, essentially their armed strength, they no longer really is a necessity for Song Gong anymore, and that is why they have begun to, to deviate away from it. Um, he, Kim Jong-un has rebalanced the party military relationship by weakening the armed forces. This essentially is what needs to happen and what appears to be happening. Because the party had become the gun, uh, or because the you know gun basically was within the party and was the military had a heavy influence in North Korea and its politics and policy, now Song Gong is no longer necessary. Kim Kim Jong Un can now begin to uh, to to put power back into the hands of the proletariat, back into the hands of the local party leadership, into the hands of the people again, and the, essentially that means sacking military leaders who will not leave their posts, and essentially making sure that the people once again are the ones that are in control, that the party is in control and not the military, because the military being in control is just reactionary. So essentially, the military is being phased back into the what they should be, being subservient to the people, being the coercive arm of... Well, that is essentially what the military and the police are supposed to be. They're supposed to be the coercive arm of that of whatever state you have. In this case, they are the coercive arm of the proletariat. In other words, the people control them, and they and so that way, the military actually has to go back to that old to the revolutionary struggle, that revolutionary path, uh, revolutionary path of actually, you know, being there as nothing more as the people's. Well, what it's supposed to be, the people's guard. And the people are the ones that are supposed to be in control at the local levels. That being said, this would mean that this would mean a complete phasing out of the military in the government. Sure, you would have your your cabinet officials, like you'd have your top military leaders that would that would advise Kim Jong-un, but Kim Jong-un would still be the would still be the one that makes the decisions. The Supreme People's Assembly would still make a lot of the decisions, and the Supreme People's Assembly would be filled with normal proletariat again. And this is essentially what needs to happen and what is seeming to be happening. And that is a good thing, because now the North Korea is transitioning back to, to following Juche and following Marxist-Leninist ideology, they can begin to start building on the old ideals and stuff like that and hopefully be able to start transitioning a path down to communism. This could essentially mean that within the few next few decades, North Korea could actually become the first actual and real communist state. We've never actually had a real communist state. We've had socialist states. We've had states that have been in transition from capitalism to communism. But we've never actually had a true communist state. And North Korea could actually be on the path to that. And that's, I think, what ultimately scares a lot of the U.S. imperialists. What scares the Western world is the fact that they have tried to, for so long, 
stagnate and oppose and impede the progress of this transition. They have tried to stop and, well, as the Marshall Plan basically is, is a containment of communism. They have tried to contain socialism and prevent it from ever reaching communism because they know that if any state ever actually did make it to communism and actually had any actual level of equality, not to mention the very fact that you can't have that because we want to get our markets in there and we want to exploit your people and we want to profit off of them. But you can't do that if the state is socialist and transitioning to communism and is well, adamant in getting to that point. And I think that we are ultimately going to see that. I think that that is why they fear that so much. Because they know that if it is act, gets to that point and it is successful, then that means that people will start to say, hey, you know, maybe communism ain't that bad. Maybe actually following their lead wouldn't be so bad. Maybe actually if we st stepped in there and actually did something for ourselves, if we overthrew our government and tried to, tra to do the, go that path, maybe things would actually be a lot more better for us. And, of course, that would be a direct threat to, well, capitalist, to ruling class power. So, yeah. In the first part of the two-part interview with North Korean News, um, Kim, uh, Kim Kun-sik of the professor at Kyongnam University talked about a number of issues, including his assessment of North Korea under the Kim Jong-un regime, its ideological and political changes, and new foreign policy. After receiving his doctorate from Seoul National University, Kim worked as a researcher at the Institute of Far East Studies before he joined the uh, faculty at Pyongyang University. He had visited Pyongyang as a special entourage to President Ru Moon Hoon in 2007 Inter-Korea Summit and met Kim Jong-il in person. He was registered on the 2011's Marquise Who's Who. Um, Kim had actually stated that North Korea under the Soryong or leader system is a sort of dynasty. The power of Kim Jong Un took was uh, took was inherited, something that was given to him in order to stand on his own feet. Kim Jong Un had to wipe away his father Kim Jong Il's shadow from the regime. How's the best way you wipe away that shadow? You do something different. You show how how good of a le you show what you can do as a le what you can do as a leader, and as well as that deviating away and doing something that actually is different from your predecessor's past. And one of the biggest things that Kim Jong-un could have done and is becoming very successful at, at such a young age, is getting rid of Song Gong. It wasn't an easy task since he had a short time for secession and power and compa compared to his father. However, I would say he has been quite successful in general. He succeeded in downsizing the influence of the military, which he has, uh, which had become bloated under Kim Jong Il's Song Gong politics, and he has also succeeded in restoring the party back to the center of leadership. Again, also true. Now, once again, it's one of those things where I've talked about this before. I kind of predicted most likely where this was going. Jason Unruh spoke on it. It's not that hard to really figure out, but this is where it was most likely going. So, um, Kim, um, yeah, Kim Sik also stated that um, it's true that he changed the top post like the Minister of People's Armed Forces, the Chief of General Political Bureau, and the Chief of the General Staff of the Korean People's Army. The military had the lion's share of power and rights in North Korea and was the most seasoned elite power group under Song Gong politics. It probably wouldn't be easy to dominate such a group in two or three years. The party has now secured superiority over the military. That being one of the key things about that. The party has now secured their superiority over the military, something that has not happened since Kim Jong-il's reign began. And now that Kim Jong-un is in there, he is basically reverting you know, the military back to the way it's supposed to be. 
And the problem is, is that a lot of the um, the reason why he, his his uncle was executed and a couple of different military officials were executed was because a lot of these military officials had become reactionary. They had become very cozy in their in their positions, and they wanted to keep those positions. They feared that that they feared Kim Jong Un sacking them and removing them from power. And because of that, they began to sell out and betray their country by trying, by you know, essentially trying to have foreign influences to try and uh, to secure their seat on power. Essentially, what Kim Jong Un's uncle was planning to do was to overthrow him and secure his position in power. Essentially, creating a capitalist but authoritarian military dictatorship and Kim Jong-un did what he was supposed to do and went in there and stopped what was going to happen he foiled a, a planned coup d'etat and well because his uncle has committed treason he did what a leader should do when you commit treason against your country you're gonna pay the consequences and just because your family does not mean that you get any special treatment. And in Jang's case, he was executed because he essentially betrayed his country. He sold out secrets, North Korean secrets, and he also, well, he betrayed a revolutionary path and essentially betrayed his family. I mean, if someone in my family ever betrayed me, I'd probably be pretty fucking pissed too. But the, fr the frequent reshuffling promotions and demotions in the military may indicate the unstable nature of seizing power, but it al may also show that Kim was trying hard to take power. And it has been successful so far. The party has now secured superior superiority over the military. Cho Yong Hei and Huang Pyong uh, Huang Pong So now have sway in the now hold sway in the military. Both have party origins and are not career soldiers at all. Choi is a kind of shareholder in the regime since he is the son of a gorilla who fought with Kim Il Sung. Huang is more like the professional manager who is chosen for his who is chosen for his capacity and diligence. Um, after the chairman Li. When he's departure, the first thing the son Lee Jae Young would will do would be weeding out his father's guys. The first was the dismissal of Ri of Ri Young Ho in 2012. The four KPA to top brass who followed Kim Jong Il's hearse right behind it, including Ri, then the chief of the general staff, who knocked out uh, after his dismissal were knocked out after his dismissal, namely Kim Jong Il's cadre in the military. Has, had been ousted. The second was the return of Pak Pongju as premier. After his comeback, there was a generational shift in the cabinet. Minister class posts were replaced by younger, younger technocrats. The purge of Jang represents a similar change of, of generation in the, in the party. The elite group established long before Kim Jong Un took power was removed with the purge. Now, um, and as I said, Jang Song Hitek's uh, alleged resistance uh, to the regime's decision to give the, the rights back to the military, and that trigger uh, um, Jang's alle allegedly resisted the regime's decision to give the rights back to the military, and that triggered the purge. Um, yeah, his purge also represents the fight for rights within the po power elite. The power and the rights of the administration, the party, and the military were heavily concentrated in Jang. There could have been a sort of anti-Jang alliance among those that were isolated from these rights. Um, uh, South Korean Intelligence Service an analyzed that it began with a clash between the military and the party administration group over the exclusive fishery rights. Jang allegedly resisted the regime's decision to give the rights back to the military and that triggered the purge, but we can never be sure. It's still early to say whether, uh, whether uh, Choi lost his power, even though it seems that uh, Choi's status has been adjusted lower with his recent dismissal from the Presidium of the Politico. You can read more about this interview with um, with this guy, but um, 
essentially the rundown being is he goes into great detail that really that all these steps of removing and sacking these top military leaders was necessary for the continued stabilization of the North Korean government, the continued revolutionary path that it's on, and the smooth transition in this in moving away from Song Gong and militarism back to socialism and back down a path that will eventually take it to communism. So essentially all of this in general is pretty much stating that the military sacking is a is prime example that Song Gong is fading away in North Korea. So that all being said, we have to actually give credit where credit is due. Whether you like Kim Jong-un or not, whether you support him or his regime or North Korea at all, you have to give credit where credit is due that he is at least seizing the moment to get rid of these, these military, uh, all these military advisors and essentially putting the military in their place and saying, you belong where you're supposed to belong, and that is being subservient to the people. It also shows a great thing that is supposed to happen within a revolutionary system, because as revolutionaries get over, uh, get older, people like, and it's happened to a lot of people, Mao, it happened to, to the Castros, and essentially it's, I would even use the Castros as, as an example, between them and North Korea. Kim Jong-un is actually doing what revolutionaries are supposed to do, and that's transitioning power away from military leaders and the older, uh, the older class, the, the older uh, generations, and putting it into a educate, well-educated revolutionary proletariat, and back into the hands of the young, back into the hands of the young people, people of Kim's generation, and people slightly younger than him, but also, but mainly in that, that really nice bracket, whereas the Castros and most of the Communist Party of Cuba has pretty much been the same from the get-go, and most of the people that have held leadership are very much in their 50, their, their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s even. A lot of these are the old-school revolutionaries, and they've gotten reactionary with age, and basically, that's one of the things that has been taught is that it, through revolutionary struggle, is that you have to at some point turn the revolutionary struggle over to the next generation of a revolutionary class. And in this case, Kim Jong Un understands that, and he knew that it had that, especially being a young person himself, being of like 31 years old. He knew it was time that he needed to basically get with the times. Because if he left the older generation in power, he was not going to be there long. And revolutionary struggle was not going to be around very much longer in North Korea either. And something had to change. So in this case, he's taking the power away from the military, putting them back where they're supposed to be, being being to serve the people, serve the proletariat, and serve the party, and transitioning party and political and revolutionary struggle back into the hands of that younger proletariat, thus giving that new generation a chance to grow and thrive and progress North Korea into the future. And that is something that I think that Kim Jong-un greatly understands and actually deserves a lot of credit for because he's actually going about this in pretty much the right, the right of ways. I've never claimed in the past to ever like Kim Jong-un because I didn't know enough about him to actually have an opinion. Now that I've actually begun to know more about Song Gong, no, educate myself more about North Korea and educate myself more about him and s study what's been going on in the country these last couple of years, my opinion of him definitely has changed. I actually do genuinely like Kim Jong-un. 
at least in the sense of how he goes about what he's doing, about how he implements certain policy, how he goes about his, uh, following Marxist-Leninism down to a T. I would actually go so far as to actually say that Kim Jong-un pretty well understands Marxist-Leninist theory very well and actually has the potential to be a great revolutionary leader and actually has the potential to transition North Korea into a communist age. And whether that happens under his regime or he turns it over to the next generation, and I really do hope that he continues that path and that this uh, generation of revolutionaries eventually turns it over to the next generation, I think that they will have astounding success. And I really do have to give a lot of credit and say that I am genuinely impressed with how Kim Jong-un and the younger generation of revolutionaries in the country are handling this transition and are actually and how they're going about this. It's tremendously uh, it's just tremendously astounding and I, I I actually have to say I am genuinely impressed and I actually do I actually do like Kim Jong Un at least as a politician so far as a as a leader because he actually has had his successes that's not saying that I agree I completely I agree with the North Korea, uh, with some of North Korea's policies or his policies or completely agree with you know how things are because to be honest I've never really been a fan of hereditary leadership but at least as a leader himself he's showing he's very suave very sophisticated and very and very very bright I'd have to say so that and not only that the dude I mean he, he must have to be a pretty good dude if Dennis Rodman fucking likes him I'm just saying the dude must have a pretty good sense of humor and must be a have a good personality you can't really say that about a whole lot of people so yeah not trying to praise the dude or anything but I am definitely saying that this is that policy wise as a, as a analysis of a leader as a politician he seems to be going about this very well so uh, yeah now, the last thing that I'd like to talk about is, um, is, is CPS, or Child Protective Services, and depending on where you are, Child Welfare Services within the United States. Now, CPS has recently removed this, guy, this young disabled boy, uh, Bubby, from his parents' home after apparently his parents um, missed a hospital visit. Now, or a hospital, or a doctor's appointment, or something like that. Now, the media is trying to point fingers, trying to say this family is, you know, has neglect, has medically neglected this boy, and blah blah blah. But the way that it really is looking is that this was a loving, caring family that happened to just make a simple mistake. It. You know, people get forgetful. They things happen, and they don't always remember shit. You know, they can't. You know, and they happen to miss a doctor's appointment. And apparently, their child was taken away, and now is in the uh, care of the well, the state, the foster care system, where most likely the children are more likely to be abused than they are with their actual families. As a person that has dealt with CPS and has had a sibling placed in state custody, thankfully under the custody of another family member, it is just completely insane and just a system that I think is greatly flawed and corrupted. I mean, the, my own family has suffered tremendously, even the family member that is taking care of my, my younger sister. The, the system has continuously 
gone back on their words. They have flip flopped. They have they they have just been insanely di- disorganized and don't and, and extremely shady at times and really don't ever seem like they give a genuine crap about you, much less the child they are claiming to be protecting. No, their, their only main interest in is gaining quotas and is meeting quotas so that they can get their paycheck at the end of the goddamn day. Because much like how police harass people and pull people over and give people citations and tickets, they're doing the same thing at CPS by removing children from, not saying that not all the homes are where kids aren't being abused, because there are kids that are abused, but they are also taking a lot of children out of perfectly good homes from families that love them, care for them, and placing them in foster care systems where they are neglected, they are abused, they are raped, and everything else. And CPS does not seem to give a flying fuck about that or the people's feelings that are involved. Not only that, you also have to, if you're the person involved whose child has been taken away, you have to bend over backwards and practically shove your own head up your ass to appease the fucking state. Meanwhile, they fuck up and suddenly it's your fault or that, you know, they fail to do something and there's no consequence you fuck up one time and you you know it's one of those things where it's you may never see your child again i mean the way that cps is run is very unscrupulous and very frankly very fascist in how it, it goes about things i mean literally what they're getting away with is legal kidnapping and there's actually a guy that uh that I actually have a link to that it will be in the description. His name is Carlos Morales. He was a former CPS worker and now is a actual whistleblower who talks about the CPS corruption and how they they legally they get away with legal kidnapping of children and talks about quotas and everything else that I've just mentioned as well. He goes into a, quite a bit of detail about it. Now, the reason why I even got onto the subject about Booby in the first place and his family was actually through Mr. Repsion. I can't, his, one of his videos showed up in my recommended things, and being a critic of CPS, I actually clicked on one, I uh, clicked on the, his videos. Now, I've seen Mr. Repsion's videos in the past. I usually don't pay too much attention to him. Every now and again, I will watch one just for the sake of, because it might be a topic that I myself am actually interested in or have covered and so he talked a bit about this and he knew the fit knows the family personally so I had to it's one of those things that yes it kind of affects you when you know the family personally and stuff like that and this kid is a great good kid he's a disabled kid and he's a good kid uh, and his family seems very nice they seem very loving and caring and affectionate and they, you know, this family's lives, the family's lives has been ripped apart, and this young boy has to, you know, is having to deal with, you know, is having to deal at like the age of nine years old, I think, with the fact that he can't see his fucking parents and stuff like that, other than every other week or so. His parents are having to go practically daily to fucking court to fight for the rights to get their child back to prove that they are actually you know worthy parents and stuff like that and they shouldn't even have to because CPS is getting away with fucking kidnapping their child and frankly I've had enough of CPS myself and I had to actually say something myself about this issue given the fact that I have been personally affected by it myself and witnessed my family have to go through it and have to be subjected to the Gestapo's fucking idiocy. I've had to be fingerprinted because I happen to live in the home 
and it's bullshit because I don't understand why people have to, you know, I don't understand why any of this has to happen in the first place. I mean, frankly, there are worse places that these kids, you know, could wind up. And frankly, there are worse places that these children do wind up after they've been placed into CPS custody. And it's absolutely sickening that nothing is being done about it. I've actually, on two separate occasions, have filed a complaint with the Department of Health and Human Services. Not just with my state, but with the federal government. I've actually gone to them and filed a complaint, and they do fucking nothing. Because they don't give a fuck about you. But something has to be done. At least on a bourgeois liberal standpoint, there has to be some sort of reform. There should at least be a fucking investigation into, certain, into some of these the, these chapters, especially in, in, in Solano County and, uh, and and wherever the fuck the, this uh, county, county took place. I think it was up near Seattle or something like that. But, yeah, the, something needs to change. Because, frankly, to keep hearing people's horror stories, and I've seen a whole lot of them, is just saddening and then to see what happens to some of these kids after they've been taken out of their families' homes is just is even more saddening and it's sickening. And frankly, I think that not only should CPS be held accountable, I think there's also a lot of CPS agents and even judges that should frankly be thrown in jail and whatever fucking and let the fucking gangs get at them and well, whatever fucking happens, happens. But I'm just... It, it is just extremely aggravating to even have to talk about this because I have had to deal with the, with it myself. I've had to deal with the Wathen SS, you know, being involved in my family's lives and even every so often still have to deal with the fact that of having the frickin' Luftwaffe at my goddamn door. I'm hoping you're all enjoying these fascist Nazi puns, by the way, because I'm absolutely enjoying letting loose on this hell hole of an agency. And frankly, I think that it's just... It, it's also played a part in why people have had, like, uh, why, uh, like, family rights issues get brought up and why associations about family rights I think there's one that's called um, family rights American family rights committee or something like that anyway but there's lots of these groups that talk about that and who've had their horror stories to share and th this is not just a one time occurrence this happens this happens quite a lot I mean, just about a year ago, there was a girl who was 17 years old who had cancer, and she, instead of taking chemotherapy, she chose to, un to treat her cancer with hemp oil, which has been proven to actually speed up remission and pretty much give, leave people cancer-free after a certain amount of treatments yet when the yet the government then ended up saying well no you can't do that and your parents allowing you to do that is just not good for you so we're going to take you away from your parents and so at 17 years old they took this girl in, at 17 years old she's almost legally an adult but technically because she's still under the age of 18 she's still a minor, she was taken from her family's home and placed into state custody. And now is, and was then being forced to take chemotherapy. You know, a drug that not only can cause severe damage to other, to other parts of your body and puts poisonous chemicals into it, but to be forced into that almost reminds me a lot of Nazi sterilization. No, it literally does. And yes, I'm going to go ahead and compare being forced into chemotherapy to Nazi sterilization policy. 
Now, if you do it willingly, that's another story, and that's your prerogative, and that's your choice. And I guarantee, and with all due and and all respect given, you have the free will and the choice to take what to take whatever drugs you want to. But personally, this girl chose to go to treat her cancer alternatively with something that wasn't going to cause her, you know, that torment, that pain, make her hair fall out, and make her extremely sick, and weaken her immune system. She instead she chose to to take hemp oil, which could actually which could send her into remission treat her cancer, leave her cancer free without really any adverse side effects. But no, apparently because the gov because you know it's hemp oil and cannabis, it's illegal and we want you to take our drugs, not those drugs, because we want to make money. And so because and if you don't do what we say and because you're under the age, you know, then we're going to lock you up. But we can't really do that because, you know, your parents are responsible until you're 18. So we're going to blame your parents and take you away from them because we want our money. Because that, that's basically what it is. As well as the fact that they also, you know, CPS wants to meet quotas. And, yeah. I mean, I could go into a long spiel if I wanted to about that. But it's just, again... This is not just a one-time occurrence. This has happened many, many times to many, many families, you know, who, for the most part, have actually done everything they possibly can to be the best parents or guardians or support systems to their kids. And yet, now, uh, this whole group of freaking stormtrooper fucking assholes is suddenly starting to tell you and dictate to you how you can and can't raise your kids and what can and can't happen. You know, and it's it's absolutely astounding the level of fucking totalitarianism that government and these agencies are resorting to. And it has to be stopped. So, it's with that all said, I'm actually going to in the um, I'm actually going to provide a few links. There's legallykidnap.net. There's also a change.org uh, petition to um, to help bring uh, Bubby home, and uh, I and all these other articles that basically talk about CPS corruption and everything like that. So feel free to check those out. Feel free to check out any of the links provided for any of the other topics I've talked about in this video. And uh, yeah, thank you guys for watching. We've actually hit an hour in this. So um, yeah, I'm NorCal Nick, leader of the revolutionist movement, and this has been NorCal Corner. Peace, guys. Uh,